Good afternoon, everybody. My name is John Cross, one of the uh, uh, part of your delegation here and one of the commissioners from Ohio. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us again for the best panel discussion of the day. Oh, right. Right. Signing. Right. Setting the bar high, exactly right. Well, um, we are excited to be here uh, and to have a great conversation about what we're working on here in the Ohio uh, House and the Ohio Senate. Uh, with regards to higher education, and we brought some all-stars here with us today. I'm going to let them introduce themselves and, and talk uh, about some things they're working on in both the Senate and the House, uh, and then we're going to open it up for questions. But uh, to uh, my friend in the House and the Senate, uh, we've got some great folks here in higher education from the Midwest, fellow colleagues and other legislatures. Uh, and uh, we understand first that it, it's a competitive spirit. So some of the things we're going to talk today, uh, obviously feel free to duplicate or do whatever, but we, we all want the Midwest to win when it comes to higher education, workforce, and economic development. Um, but it's also a great sporting event when we compete against each other and other states. And so it's a good competitive spirit. And I think that competitive spirit what, what makes uh, the Midwest very strong when it comes to job opportunities, economic and workforce development based upon the relationships of our institutions of learning. So I'll let my good friend, uh, Senator Serino start from the Senate because he's from the Senate. We know that the Senate's a very important body in the Ohio House and the Ohio General Assembly. <laughs> He's a salesman. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and, and, and welcome to Ohio. Um, and uh, talk about the competitive spirit of this. Please feel free to send as many of your students in your state to Ohio for <laughs> higher education. We'd be happy to accommodate them, right, Bruce? Yes, yes we will. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, it's great competition, and there's probably a lot that we all can learn from each other and replicate uh, respectively in, in our in our home states. Um, so I, uh, I'm finishing up the second year of my first four year term uh, in the Senate. Uh, kind of a latecomer to politics. Uh, I ran for office for the first time when I was 65 uh, as a county commissioner in Lake County, which is along the, the eastern part of the uh, of Lake Erie on the north. Uh, and I'm a retired uh, medical device CEO uh, and worked in private equity and a number of other uh, public companies uh, in the medical device field and decided to get into public policy because I always liked public policy, but I never had time traveling internationally to uh, to really go to meetings or to run for office, et cetera. So when our last child went away to college and I sold my last business, I thought this would be a great time to do it. So I jumped in as uh, commissioner and then uh, came to the Senate uh, in the election of 2020. Uh, and actually, my, my first priority during the campaign, and it continues to be, is education, particularly higher education. Uh, and so I was uh, asked to be vice chair of the Senate Committee on Higher Education for the last two years. Uh, and I'll be talking as we proceed here a little bit, bit about some of the things we've accomplished this year uh, with a very important bill, Senate Bill 135. Uh, but I just uh, I think it's great uh, to have this type of venue where we can uh, share information with you and hopefully you'll share some of yours with us. Uh, and, and we'll be happy to answer any questions. But uh, we take education very seriously here in Ohio, uh, as, as I'll do all of you, I'm sure. And uh, we look forward to sharing some of our thoughts on the issues. And again, we'd love to get your reaction and your feedback as well. Well, good afternoon, everybody. How y'all doing today? Good. Well, my name is Dontavius Geralds. I'm proud to be uh, a state representative for the 25th House District uh, right here in Columbus, Ohio. Actually, you're not in my district, uh, but you're about five blocks away from it. And uh, but it's, it's my first time, uh, first term in office. I was uh, elected in, in 2020 um, during the uh, good old pandemic. And uh, I will tell you uh, what's unique about being elected during that time, as some of you may have been as well, is our young people were struggling. And in fact, when we think about, and I've talked to so many uh, college students who say that their time during the during COVID in higher ed was, was, was tumultuous, to be quite frank with you. And so um, a little bit of background about me to get to uh, the, the, the introduction. Uh, I'm reaching from Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, uh, born and raised. I moved out of Columbus to work in the state house. 
Uh, I was on the other side. I came down when I was 20 years old uh, to work in the state house, loved every bit of it, said to myself, if God wants me to be in this place at one point in my life, it would be truly an honor. Uh, I didn't know 30 years or 10 years later, when I'm 30, uh, well, I'll be stepping in as a legislator. And uh, it was a great honor and privilege uh, to represent uh, the 140,000 people in House District 25. Um, when I got my committee assignments, I was like, thank God I got higher education. And working alongside uh, Chair Cross on a subcommittee for finance, we were able to do a lot to really begin to address the material conditions that students were facing as they navigated COVID and still wanted to be excellent. And, uh, and so we'll talk a little bit more about that, but I'm really excited just to be here with all of you and just thank you for your work. Um, this is my first time here and uh, it hopefully won't be my last. So I just wanna say thank you and I'm excited about the conversation. Thanks Representative Senator. So just to finish out, uh, my background, I hail from Northwest Ohio, graduated right here from The Ohio State University, uh, and got my interest in politics on my eighth grade trip to Washington, D.C., so the rest is history. But I did one thing that is interesting uh, that I'm actually fighting against. When I graduated from Ohio State, I, I soon got a phone call from a friend, and I went to California. So I left Ohio, and, uh, and, and I'll soon talk about uh, a piece of legislation that's trying to prevent students from leaving when they graduate. But I, but I went to California. I worked for Governor Schwarzenegger and his administration after he got elected. Uh, I've, I've worked in California and Texas. I, I worked in real estate development, uh, worked for Carly Fiorina uh, when she ran for the U.S. Senate, uh, started up my own uh, marketing firm. And then uh, I got my father interested in politics later in his life, Jerry, and his name was Jerry. And uh, after his his career in sales, I got him to run for county commissioner. And um and so he he passed away, and I went back home, and and uh, you know the whole town shows up, and and uh, uh, it, it was an emotional time, but also a time that reflected that hey, it's probably time to come back home, and 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 I did. I I uh, got an offered an opportunity to come back to be the president of our chamber, and run our economic development efforts for our, our small hometown community in Northwest Ohio, and from there uh, had an opportunity to run. So so I like to try to bring a a, a positive. Yeah. economic development message, really trying to tie that into higher education, because mm -hmm. one of our challenges in our Republican caucus is that when we talk about higher education, a lot of my colleagues will be the first to point out what some knucklehead liberal professor said, or CRT issues, or all the issues that have nothing to do with how we're going to help Intel build its next workforce, how Sherwin Williams decided to keep their corporate headquarters in Cleveland, Ohio, because of partnerships with Cleveland State and other universities. To brag about Ohio, we have some of the best colleges and universities in the country right here uh, in Ohio. Some could argue maybe some one too many, but we have a, a lot of independents, 14 publics. Uh, we're known for fabulous uh, institutions of higher education. And I like to think that we and the legislature have really worked hard to make big investments in, I think we're probably about a $3 billion number, a round number of about $3 billion Ohio best invests in higher education. And so we're going to start that budgeting process, but uh, here again, but let me just share this with you. I'm going to turn over to the Senator for some of the work he's worked on. I just want to talk about budgets. People all the time talk about investing in our students investing in higher education, but it's also the market conditions that can change things rapidly. I want to just point out one thing to you. In 2008, in the market meltdown, we had almost $400 million of the biennium invested into the Ohio College Opportunity Grant. Today, that number is around $220 million over the biennium. That, that we had big dollars. And, and so for our friends in Michigan who are here, thank you for, for making that $250 million investment because it's gonna wake everybody up because we have to have a response. We're not gonna let Michigan run away with $250 million of investment and not have Ohio take a swing at that. Yeah. And that's the kind of leverage we need, right? Yeah, only one guy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you know, the, if this this business of building a budget is like the stock market. It can crash real fast with market conditions that happened in 2008. 
and it takes a long time to build back up. And I like to think that we may not get it back to where it was in 2008 overnight, but we need to be the institution that helps gradually build that budget back up, just like the stock market does. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Senator again to talk about some of the um, policies that he's working on to support higher education. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Uh, by the way, when you left Schwarzenegger, I hope you didn't say, I'll be back, right? Okay. Okay. We want to keep you here. You can't afford to go back. Can't go, that's right. Um, uh, so when I was running uh, in 2020, while I was in between campaigning uh, and running a business, uh, I, was, I began working on what turned out to be the components of Senate Bill 135. Uh, they were broad brush components, but I had pretty much identified the areas that I wanted to look at. Uh, and that enabled me, as soon as I took office on January 4th of 21, uh, to really get uh, our legislative operation uh, drafting uh, various components here. And it came together uh, within three months of my taking office as Senate Bill 135. And um, I'm, I'm happy to say that um, it, it ultimately, just to jump ahead, it ended up passing on a very bipartisan basis. This was, this was an education bill, that higher education bill, that was difficult to argue most of the points. Uh, and we had some spirited discussions with, with Bruce and our community college friends here. Uh, and I think what, you know, did the bill look a lot like it did when we passed it as it did when, we, when I introduced it? No, it had a lot of changes and most bills go through that process. But uh, we were able to identify and actually work together to, uh, to uh, address the issues that everybody had with the bill. Uh, not everybody got everything they wanted, including myself, but we were able to come up with a bill that passed unanimously in the House and all but one vote in the Senate. And it turns out that my, one of my colleagues, who happens to be of the same party who voted no, didn't understand something, and he voted no out of misinformation. So it would have been unanimous, but... Uh, he he uh, uh, kept me from breaking a record there. Um, so what what we did in that bill was we 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 took a look at it's sixty eight pages. Uh, if you want to look it up sometime in some night when you can't sleep, start reading it and it'll it'll put you right out because it's not necessarily terribly exciting. Although if you're really into higher education, you might find it uh, that you can't put it down. Um, we dealt with a number of things. One was we wanted to. Uh, try to encourage and motivate folks who have stopped out for at least three semesters uh, to get back in the game. Because we knew and we checked with all the universities in our community college. We have 22 community colleges, 23, excuse me, uh, in a great community college network in Ohio. Uh, and we wanted to make to see what we could do to reach out to those students who had stopped out for any number of reasons at any point in their cohort. Uh, and try to get them to turn around and get back into something, you know, depending on their situ their personal situation. And, and so um, we, uh, and we didn't have a lot of information about what those people were doing. And so we, we came up with something called the Second Chance Grant Program, where on top of everything else that you may or may not qualify for, if you were stopped out for three semesters, uh, you could get a $2,000 one-time grant uh, to apply to a community college, another four-year institution, if that's where you stopped out, uh, to go to a qualified technical college, uh, career center, et cetera, and apply that on top of other, you know, dollars that you would qualify for from the state or the federal government. Um, we've had quite a few takers. I think we, we, have, uh, we have over 300 that have opted into this program, uh, and it's only a year and a few months old. Uh, and we think that that was a good move. Um, and we're going to continue to monitor the progress. We also did something uh, that was the subject of much debate, but we ended up uh, and addressed a shortage in nursing. And uh, which we all have, I, th I assume you all are experiencing the same thing wherever you're from. Uh, we have it certainly in Ohio uh, that we had it before COVID. It's been exacerbated certainly with COVID. And so now you can go to a the a qualified community college and get a bachelor of science in nursing uh, in the state of Ohio. Now the colleges, the community colleges have to ask for it and apply for it, go through the normal process, including accreditation. 
But for, for a lot of students who don't want to leave home to go to a major campus or, or working uh, or can't afford, you know, tuition at, at the um, uh, higher education institutions, the four years of schools, uh, they can they can do this at a significantly lower cost uh, and in a, about the same time frame that it would take if they were going to a traditional program here. Uh, we're not going to see the benefits of this, certainly for a while. So it's not intended to solve the workforce shortage in nursing right now, but we believe that we took the right steps to address this issue uh, in the long run. Uh, in our bill, we also um, streamlined the credit transfer pathways between the community colleges uh, and four-year institutions and amongst them in, in their own uh, areas. Uh, we, uh, we made it uh, a matter of law that transcripts had to be released to students who owed money uh, if they were using the transcripts in the um, uh, in the process of finding employment. We just felt that made sense. Now, a number of schools, and Bruce, correct me if I'm wrong, I think a number of universities have now even gotten broader than that mm -hmm. and are just forgiving, just releasing transcripts no matter what. Uh, we might have motivated some of that, but I think they're they're seeing that that is the right, uh, the right thing to do here. We also looked at free speech, a subject of lots of debate. And one of the things that I wanted to do in this bill was to make sure that for both faculty and students, that free speech, uh, that our institutions of higher education continue to be beacons of free speech on either side of whatever the issues might be, okay? Uh, after all, I mean, for all of us, when I went to college, which is quite a long time ago, uh, you know, it was great to have professors who were presenting both sides of the story, on an issue and that I could present my story without any fear of retribution or being ostracized in my classroom, et cetera. Uh, we can't have what I would call excellent institutions of higher education if we don't foster and push for free, free expression of opinions, okay? That's what we need to teach our, our students. And that's how they're going to, you know, really reap the benefits of their, uh, of their higher education here. Um, we also looked at guidance counseling. I don't know what some of your stats might be, but in Ohio, as of last year, the ratio uh, in our high schools of guidance counselor to students is 450 to one, which tells me there's not much guidance counseling going on. And so when our institutions of higher education, whether it's a community college or a four-year institution, get these students, they're, they're not getting everything that they ought to get from the students because they haven't been properly counseled. Uh, relative to picking um, major courses of study, picking careers, uh, deciding you know how much to go into debt, et cetera. And um, you know we didn't legislate a specific ratio because that's really up to the school systems uh, the way we're run in Ohio. But we encourage them to begin counseling uh, students early on relative to careers. That's how we're going to get to better workforce development uh, by encouraging students if you wait till you're a senior to discover that you don't want to go to a four-year school, but maybe a career in welding is a good thing for you, that's that's not as timely as it ought to be. Okay, you should be aware of in junior high school what welding or machine operations might be, or you know, uh, being an electrical and elect, electrician or a plumber. You know, we need all of those functions fulfilled, and uh, we need we believe that exposing students to what those career options are uh, is going to benefit us you know, certainly uh, in the long run. Uh, we, we tried to deal with um, some issues regarding uh, donors and donor intent and those sorts of things. And we ended up, um, you know, it, it turns out it's a very complicated issue. We had some people who were complaining about donor intent not being followed and this and that. A lot of that was wrapped up in litigation. Uh, and, you know, at the end of the day, I decided that you know, that's a battle for some other time by somebody else. Uh, it really wasn't inherent, uh, inherently a part of what I was trying to do with the higher education. Um, and um, so, again, those are sort of the general uh, uh, top topics of Senate Bill 135. I really would encourage you uh, to look at it at some point and look at, at least read the summary, which will give you a quick look at, at uh, what it includes. And we're going to be continuing those activities as I continue on the on the committee and uh, working with the House and making sure that um, you know this is a work in progress. This bill was just the beginning of a bunch of things that I think we need to do to foster higher education, and our citizens deserve it. 
and our students deserve it for what they're paying uh, in tuition and what debt load they're carrying, uh, whether it's forgiven or not. That's another discussion. Uh, and uh, it's our task as legislators to try to create that kind of environment. So thank you. Representative? Yeah, so, uh, you know, for me, oh, thank you. My voice is loud enough, y'all. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's right. Hear me back home. You're right about that, Chair. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm in the minority. And uh, the reality is we have a lot of aspirational uh, bills that we would want to push forward on. And, uh, you know, not every one of those bills could, uh, are, are going to breed consensus. I'll say it like that. Um, <laughs> But the reality is, basically, join the majority. Listen, <laughs> listen, listen. We talked about this already. Right here. We talked about this already. But the reality is, I love you, right? I love you too. Uh, the, the reality is, right? And you know, there were some things that we were able to come together on. Uh, first and foremost, you know, increasing the OCOG dollars, I think $8 million bi biannually. Uh, that was a huge step. I mean, we had a lot of conversations. Uh, during the budget uh, about what does it mean to want to increase these, these funds and how do we make sure that we're expanding access to our community colleges in some cases don't often receive or those students don't receive that, those opportunities. And so we had a lot of, uh, <laughs> I would say, uh, in-depth, fiery perspective on both sides, but we came up with a consensus to uh, increase the OCOG dollars and really do everything we can to make sure that we have, that students have access uh, to higher education opportunities. One of the bills, um, and it, this is kind of a bill that we've, I've introduced, uh, but it hasn't received much push. So I'm gonna throw it out in the atmosphere and y'all can pick it up and take it if y'all want to. Um, but one of the things that, you know, that I was really big on is our veterans and making sure that their spouses um, have opportunities to get in-state tuition, uh, especially if a, a, a loved one, uh, you know, started to pursue their uh, career in the military and for whatever reason had to be pulled out or pulled away. And those individuals are oftentimes here in the state, but they have to, they go through so many barriers to get in-state tuition. So uh, myself and Representative Alan, Adam Miller who is a veteran in his own right and uh, doing some incredible work? You know, we proposed uh, House Bill um, uh, 415, uh, which really works to redesign in state tuition for our veterans and their families and their spouses. Uh, because again, when we talk about uh, those who are providing service to our country uh, and their loved ones, we know they all provide, they all are in service right? Because of that sacrifice. And we want to make sure that we're providing support to them. Uh, the other bill that, and I know we're, uh, Chair Cross will talk a little about the tech, the tech cred, but I wanted to speak a little bit about how important that was. Um, you know, so many of our uh, uh, Ohioans have, they may not want to complete a four-year degree. And we have to do everything we can to say, it doesn't matter where you decide to show up in higher ed, you deserve as many opportunities as everyone else. And what we wanted to do was make sure that, particularly for folks that are in my district, uh, who are in the urban communities, um, when you know we see the, the, the prices of our education has gone up, we wanna make sure that everyone has access uh, to high, a higher ed opportunity. And so the fact that we were able to really um, bolster and boost the work and the budget on the tech credits piece uh, was something that I'm proud of. And I'm proud to have voted on, on the bill uh, uh, to make sure that my constituents got what they deserved. Um, the other piece I want to talk about, and it's not necessarily as much of it as higher ed, but it's supplemental to workforce. Because here's the reality, and we talk about this in our subcommittee. Our young people are getting a great education here in Ohio, but they are moving and they are leaving. And I am ecstatic that we have Intel here to bring our young people back and to keep our young people in the state. But we also know that there are policies in place uh, that unfortunately uh, make it harder for individuals who are, they may not get the high paying Intel job, but they may you know, leave college and become a social worker. And they may not make enough 
and they may be on a, uh, you know, a benefit, for example, whether it's food stamps or HEAP or, um, or a rental support. And so myself in this bipartisan bill, uh, it's called a hand up, myself and Representative Gary Click. And what we are doing is we're changing how benefits are done in this state by doing a couple of things. One, we are looking at eligibility so that when a, a person uh, is getting into that program, you know, they may be four or $5 over the, the, the eligibility threshold, but that should not immediately mean that they're off that program. So they, it gives them a three-year time frame uh, to continue to be and receive that benefit, continue to increase in the salary of their job. And then by the time they make it out of the end of that three-year period, these individuals would have supports. They would, have, they would have been supported by our state to the point where they are now independent and self-sufficient. You know, when we think about, you know, what does it mean to support our Ohioans at every income level? We know that there are some, and I'm just being honest, some degrees that don't pay a lot of money. And so what are we going to do to make sure that those young people don't leave the state for a better opportunity? They can stay here because they believe the system and the government is there to help them and pick them up and give them the supports they need to thrive in the state. And so that's those are just some of the things that we're working on uh, collectively, right? And what we're well, aspirationally, what I hope to make sure that we build in Ohio so that our young people uh, stay here, thrive here, and be the next generation of, of, of Ohioans. Thank you, so well said. <clears throat> Just a, a couple comments that we'll open up for questions, but first, I, I don't want to pontificate on the, uh, you know, the soapbox of higher education and all the things that we could work on. Uh, I, I have four years left in the legislature in the Ohio House. I have four years left to do something. Um, my first four years went extremely fast. I got 12 bills signed into law. I got $100 million back to my district. The way I look at how I function as an individual is, is the facts. I can go back to my district and I got this done. What can I accomplish in four years without solving all the world's problems yeah. in higher education? There's two bills. One, tech cred, which I'll talk yeah. about. Two is the Grow Ohio Act. And, yeah. and Mike, I hope I hope for council of governments that you can talk about the Grow Ohio Act someday in your next presentation of a great piece of legislation that we got done that put a lot of creativity in it. Well, but let me say this. We love our career tech centers. We love our community colleges. And we love our universities, both private and public. And all three matter. The problem we have in higher education, I asked higher education, I went to uh, President Trestle, I'll call him out now because he's retired, <laughs> but 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 President Trestle, I went to him because I became the chair of the committee, and I went to all the universities I could, I talked to presidents from big schools, little schools, I said, what's the biggest challenge you have in higher education? And Coach Trestle said, pre-K through 12. I love that answer, it's a great answer. Because we have to do our work in education, pre-K through 12, to make sure those kids are ready to go to community college, ready to go to college. So they're not wasting money and time taking remedial math in college when they should have got it done in high school. So that's number one. Number two is if your higher education institutions are not in love and marriage and partnered up with your economic development state agencies, they must. It is a marriage that must be it must happen, and it must happen without any piece of legislation. Uh, we have Jobs Ohio, a privatized economic development engine, and our institutions of higher education, our college presidents are on stage every time there's an economic development announcement because they are part of the economic and workforce development package in Ohio. So TechCred was, was an idea that came from Governor DeWine's administration, and the governor and lieutenant governor, John Houston, wanted to create TechCred a way to help employees, to help employers train and skill up their existing workforce. And what, what we worked on is a bill that would allow companies to go get short-term <laughs> certificates at a community college, university, a career tech center to help train their current staff. So if, if, uh, if Gary is a low entry level person at a, at a company and they can upskill him to the next position, 
it's easier to backfill the entry level job than try to search for that person with that skill set. So we're building up a workforce or upskilling a, a workforce. And boy, we've we've invested. Uh, well, I, I've kind of lost track. It was I think fifty million dollars in the in the last budget, and in my freshman year when I introduced the, introduced the bill, I think it was another. 20, 30, 40, 50 million, pick a number, but we made some major investments into this and it is so popular, so huge, companies are loving it and we're investing in our current workforce. We also added the IMAP program. So an individual not connected with a business could get scholarship dollars to go get a short-term certificate. They might be at the local Valvoline oil changing center, but they want to learn to become a diesel mechanic or a mechanic. Yeah. We can get them to get a short-term certificate without worrying about going through four years and the conversations of college debt and yada, yada, yada. Okay. So that's been a great piece of legislation for us. And it's, and, and it's easy for the legislature to invest in that because we, Ohio is getting great return on that investment by upskilling our workforce. Next, our guidance counselors really need to get off the bandwagons and tell little Johnny or Susie that, oh, it's cool today to go to career tech, oh, college, bad, debt, bad. They need to stop doing that because we're putting students in a pathway for career tech when they probably could have went to college and became successful. we got to quit picking winners and losers in the institutions of four-year, two-year, and career tech. There's a pathway for everybody. And my wife, who is a lawyer, but also in education, saw guidance counselors turning kids away from college when they when college could have been a great pathway for them. But we just put them in this line because they thought, well, their family can't afford it. They can't afford it. So we're going to put them in this line. That's awful. And that has to change. And we need to put our foot on the gas pedal to change the direction of what our guidance counselors are doing, again, in our pre-K-12 to prepare our students for advanced learning. Last, I hope to get this bill across the finish line uh, this year in the budget, but we've introduced the Grow Ohio Act. And I wanted to have one good impact like Jerry has done in the Senate with his bill. The Grow Ohio Act, uh, I kind of created this on the back of an act, it stands for Graduating and Retaining Ohio's Workforce. So um, we, we, what I wanted to do was stay out of the politics of higher ed. I wanted to focus on retention and recruitment. Recruitment on the front end to help students be recruited to colleges and universities. And retention, when they get that diploma, how do we keep them right here in the Buckeye State? And uh, so I gave, uh, I had a blank whiteboard and we, for days, worked on, I had a lot of policy folks and people in this room helping me out. And we just whiteboarded like 25 or 30 different things. And we scaled it down to four that I think we can get across the finish line and make an impact. And why are we doing this? Well, we know, we know that in our colleges today in Ohio, we're losing up to 10, 20, 30, and some universities up to 40% of our graduates to out-of-state jobs for their first job. Yep. And I thought, well, hell, Dontavious, they're probably going to all these no-income tax states. Mm -mm. They're going to Illinois, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and for God knows why, West Virginia. And, and uh, so why? Because that's where a lot of these corporate headquarters are at. So, so soon, you know, Betty Buckeye or Billy Buckeye is going to take a $150,000 job in Illinois, but they're going to soon find out that the tax structure in Illinois isn't safe. Chicago, you're probably going to get shot on the way to pick up the, the checkbook. My apologies for my friends in Illinois. But just fix your Chicago problems. But, but once, once again, we're going to compete. So, so and Illinois can poke at Ohio. We have our own problems. But the point is, if I'm going to compete and try to understand if that student making 150000 okay, I'll pick on San Diego. It's a little easier. When I lived in San Diego and made $150,000, it's not like making $150,000 in Ohio, okay, for a lot of reasons. So how do we convince these students to think about that? So here's the four things we did in this bill. First, we did a two plus two program. You graduate from a two-year uh, community college with a two-year degree, we're going to put more money in our state budget to allow you to go on to finish your four-year degree if that's what you want to do. We don't want to hold students back from earning a four-year degree if they feel they can advance their careers and need that, okay? Uh, second, if any business in Ohio has paid internships, paid uh, apprenticeships or co-ops, we're going to give you a 30% tax credit on those paid internship wages as number one, as a thank you to those businesses for doing that, because internships lead to job placements. Job placements lead to people staying here on the tax rolls for many, many years. 
So, so we thank the businesses for doing those internships and we want them to take that 30% tax cut on those paid internship waivers and add more internships, invest in your future workforce. It's the greatest way to recruit people. We all know, and I went through how many unpaid internships in politics. We did this stuff as pages, as interns, because we loved being in this business. But if you're paid, well, you just feel like you're part of the team. And what a better way to uh, help a business grow by allowing to do more internships. Three, in Ohio, unlike some other states that, that get this right, we don't have any merit-based scholarships inside our state budget. So we're going to create a merit-based scholarship program uh, that would, that would, uh, we're, we want to be in the business of poaching. We want to go out and poach your best and brightest students in your state. I, I, I'm I, sorry. I know you all think like this is supposed to be collaboration. I'm coming for your best and brightest. And I'm writing bills to try to get your best and brightest. We want them. We need them. So we're going to try to keep Ohio's best and brightest. We're coming for your best and brightest. And we're going to poach them with a $25,000 scholarship that becomes a forgivable loan. Okay, so if you come to Ohio or you're in Ohio and you're the top 5% of your high school graduating class with a STEM degree or entering a STEM field, we're going to give you $10,000 the first year, five, five, and five years, two, three, and four. And when you graduate, stay here, take your first job offer here, 33% forgivable interest loan. Uh, second year you stay here, I think it's I think it's around 50% forgivable. But by the third year you stay here, we're going to wipe that puppy out. We're going to give you a 100% forgivable loan because 25 grand, we're going to make, as the greedy tax collector, we're going to make more money off you by, by sales tax and income tax and all the stuff that you do by investing in your own careers and your own. So 25 grand, the return on investment, I got a person to fulfill a job. Uh, who's in the top 5% of their class in a STEM degree field. That's who I want. Is 25,000 up? I don't know, but we'll, we'll negotiate in a budget. Maybe we put, you know, $20 million in, in, a, in, a, in a bucket of money. Maybe we put two point money. It's just however many scholarships we want to give out, you do the math. But we have to have a merit-based scholarship to get the best of rights in Ohio and around the country to stay here. Last, this is the big one. This is the one I'm going to have to sell everybody in the House and the Senate. If you graduate from any school, public, private, law school, medical school, professional school, graduate school, undergrad, and you take your first job in Ohio, and you stay here one, two, and three, you pay no income tax. We will give you your income tax back to you as a refund the first year you work, the second year you work, and the third year you work. Take that $1,500 you make or $2,000 that you pay the state taxes and pay down your college debt. Invest in an MBA. Uh, buy a house. It's our way to say thank you because the greedy tax collector is going to collect your taxes years four through 99. But if we can get you here the first three years, we can get you here for a lifetime. Now, I thought about, you know, if I had that deal in place before I left California, I'd probably give it a, another thought. And, and we still don't want to discourage kids from going away. I mean, my life would be completely different. I would have never met my wife in California. Things can, can happen. We want people to get a worldly experience. But we can't let the floodgates open out and, and train them and love them and teach them and then just let them go to your state and prosper. You get the benefit. We want them back. We want to hold them. We want to keep them. And that's the awesome part about being collaborative and competitive. If, if, I, if, I, wasn't, uh, if I was really uh, a knucklehead legislator, I wouldn't tell you a damn thing about that bill. Go, go duplicate it. Go copy it. Go get as creative as you can, because that's the point. The competition will settle the market. I was the only Republican in my caucus that killed an amendment in the budget to cap tuition, because I believe in a free and fair market. If Miami University wants to be the highest, most expensive public university in Ohio, someone's going to write that check. Why? Because there's a good return on investment. Ain't no one saying Harvard or Yale is expensive. I don't hear that debate because they know that that degree and that diploma is worth it. We have a debate here in Ohio too much about college costs and tuition. We care too much about giving away free college and paying off free debt. What we want to do is invest the money on the front end through the budget process. 
and invest now. Invest in, so when they have a little skin in the game, the student has a little skin in the game, and he or she graduates, that, that number that they have to pay off at the end is a little bit less because we put a big chunk up front and we invested in them on up front. Every state in the Midwest should get as competitive as you can because our real estate costs are cheaper, our safety is better. This is a great place to raise a family. The, the West Coast and the East Coast are becoming challenging places for businesses to thrive and, and people to live in. And I can tell you that because I lived in California. I worked in Texas, lived in Texas. Overnight, when I, when I was working in real estate, uh, overnight, we moved our corporate headquarters from San Diego to uh, Dallas, Texas. I made 13% more in my paycheck overnight because Texas had no state income tax. And if Ohio becomes a state that has no state income tax, then the Grow Ohio Act bill goes away. But until we get there, we want to throw every incentive we can to try to get this place fired up. So obviously, I'm getting fired up. He's about ready to say you're done. <laughs> yeah. Just a quick comment before we, we turn over. Uh, notwithstanding my colleagues' um, uh, comments uh, sharing our poaching strategy with you uh, and comments about Chicago, uh, but really, I think I think the, the the takeaway from what John just described uh, is that we're taking we're taking it very aggressively uh, in in the state of Ohio. Education is important. Retention of our students is important. Uh, every state's got an issue with students, you know, not necessarily sticking around. Uh, so it, it is a competitive environment, and we all compete with each other, certainly. But our, our interest this afternoon was to share with you some of, of our thoughts about specific programs and bills, um, but also our enthusiasm for the need to aggressively uh, be very proactive in this area. Otherwise, once you're left behind, I think, as fast-paced as everything is moving, uh, there may be no catching up for a state that gets too far behind the eight ball here. So. Thank Turn you. over to Join you. me in thanking our panel for today. Thank you.